and welcome back. In any TV show, whether reality, competition based, or even scripted TV, there are always questionable decisions that the production makes that make the audience go, well, well, come on now, really? Especially for a show like The Challenge that has been on 30 plus seasons, has over 500 episodes, and have been on the air since 1998. And that's what this video is all about. Questioning a decision that production has made either via the format of a season, format of uh, finals, rules of a season or finals, or questioning how production handled a player's behavior on a season. Now, as I mentioned with how expansive the challenge history is, there's bound to be a whole bunch of decisions and moments that made the audience scratch their heads. But for the sake of time, I grabbed a handful of these decisions, these moments, and I wanted to talk about these specific ones. I have about six or seven. Now, I know there's a ton more, so if you're watching this video and you like it and you would like another part, let me know another questionable decision that production has made if it's not featured in this video and let me know down in the comment section below. I will do research on that moment or situation and possibly put it in a part two of this series. But for now, let's start off with a more recent questionable decision by the production team and that was in Challenge 37, the finals. For the Challenge 37 finals, it was pretty standard early on. It was a solo format where players were doing different tasks until they got to the end of the penultimate episode of the season where the players had to do a puzzle, then run to the next checkpoint where they were put into two teams of four. Once the teams are formed, that's when everybody was having to do tasks in their teams all the way up to the night portion. Then they woke up the next day and the losing team had to go into an elimination against each other. This is where the questions start to form. Whoever won these eliminations would get to choose anybody to be their partner, whether they wanted to stick together or pick players who are standing in front of them, a part of the winning team. When this was announced, I think everybody was taken aback because the whole point of the first day was null and void. The format essentially let players lose 90% of these finals because beyond this point, once they picked who they want their partner to be, it was run up the mountain and run back down remembering a really long phone number and then opening up a safe. There was nothing left. I mean, I could even say 95%. You could lose 90% of these finals, win an elimination, specifically against a loved one, against your girlfriend. I won't give up. I'm not gonna just roll over and let somebody else win. I know Casey wants me to give it my all, and I'm going to, to a certain extent. I want this more for Casey than I do myself. And be able to pick the number one player, despite you losing the entire finals. Just think about how many meetings they had about the season, about the format, going into the finals, and how many people heard this idea, greenlit, and gave that a thumbs up, thinking that was a good idea. Now, not to take anything away from Casey's win on the season, because she played within the rules, within the format, and you can't really take that away from her. I mean, the check has been cleared. But honestly, Casey was exposed in these finals. She might be physically strong, but her puzzle solving skills were atrocious. Yet she was handed a silver platter being able to choose CT and get that money. And it was all because of a questionable decision on the format that production designed from the very beginning of this season. That was just like, what the hell were you thinking? Another final that was heavily questioned by the audience was in season 35, Total Madness. In the season, it was ambiguous via what TJ was saying in the script that he was telling everybody throughout the season that it left a lot of questions in the viewer's mind whether this was going to be a season that had multi winners, one man and one woman, or a solo winner a la season 33, season 32, and season 31. For those of you that can embrace the madness and survive, one million dollars. The only person you can trust is yourself. This is an individual game. And that lack of transparency led to a lot of the audience members believing that there was only going to be one winner. We jump to the finals of season 35, Total Madness, and lo and behold, Jenny West crosses the finish line first. TJ congratulates her as the winner, and then Bananas crosses the finish line, and TJ also congratulates that he is the winner. A lot of audience members were confused by this, 
thinking that Jenny West was the sole winner and should have gotten the whole $1 million by herself instead of sharing 500 grand. This is where rumors started to form around social media. One major rumor that started to spread around was that Total Madness was indeed supposed to be a solo winner. But because Jenny West crossed the finish line first and Bananas was close behind her, the idea that production had talked to Jenny West asking if it was okay to split the money, that they would both become challenge champs and that they would be able to be co-winners on the season. And then they had to redo Jenny West crossing the finish line and Bananas crossing as well and being all excited. I can see where this rumor started to pick up a lot of steam. I don't know if I 100% believe the rumor that it was supposed to be one winner. I agree that TJ's wording on the season was ambiguous, but I would put more fault on the actual scriptwriter than the format of the season. But I think that there would have been a lot more to this if this was real, like more people would come out saying like, yes, they fudged the numbers. Yes, they had to go refilm the ending. I think if the rumors were true and they actually talked to her and made a deal with her, she would have been on the next couple of seasons of the challenge. Granted, there was a pandemic and there was like a travel lockdown, but I think that she would have been able to come on to the season 37. And if she would have been on the last couple of seasons, she would have won probably three seasons in a row. Jenny West is that good of a competitor, but that's just my thought process on it, that she would have been on more seasons if she would have made the deal instead of not being on the last like two seasons slash three seasons now. But just to put into perspective how big this rumor was, on the night that Bananas and Jenny were crowned challenge champions, they actually went live on Instagram together and Bananas asked Jenny point blank if the season was supposed to be one winner or two, did they refilm the ending? There's a lot of uh, naysayers out there, okay, that have put a lot of rumors forth that one of them, my favorite one right now is that the final was originally for a million dollars for one winner. And after I didn't get first place, we then reshot the intro, okay? And then you no. said that, no, never mind. It's 500 for guys and 500 for girls. Did that happen? I don't remember. No. Maybe it's the altitude. No way, dude. No way, bro. There, there's no way. We don't play that. There's no funny business on the challenge, dude. There's no favorites. There's no funny business. Everything is 100 solid. I've seen rumors apparently I I split them I split the money with him and said that like he had you know said that he'd won it's ridiculous he had won and we were supposed to split the money anyway that's how it was anyway. But let's be real, this isn't the only bananas wins that have come into question by the viewers. As we remember back in season 28, Rivals 3, where we have bananas and Sarah making it to the finals, and bananas getting enough points to make the decision at the end whether he wanted to keep all the money for himself or split it with his partner Sarah, and he took all the money for himself. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take the money and run, teacher. Now, it has come out years after that season that in an interview, Sarah said that she found Adderall pills on Banana's person at the end of that season, helping him stay on that log during that night portion and taking him over the top with the points to where he was able to make that decision on whether he wanted to keep all the money or not. At the finish line, right before TJ announces, you know, who won, the crew, like, searched his jacket and found Adderall that he didn't have a prescription for and was taking the whole season to give him an edge. And on a challenge where we were supposed to stay up all night, on a, like, standing on a log, and he's taking a very obviously a performance enhancing drug and then they fine him three thousand dollars now this was not made public at all until sarah was in that interview on the mike lewis podcast bananas was not stripped of the money he was not stripped of the title instead he was ordered to pay a fine which come on now he just pocketed like 270 grand i think he would be willing to pay any fine to get that challenge championship and whatever money was left over to do whatever he wanted with, and to have that iconic challenge moment of taking all the money for himself. Speaking of partners taking all the money for themselves, it's no surprise that the second time that twist was implemented on a season finals, that it was questioned in everybody's mind on, is this win real? Because in season 32, Final Reckoning, which was basically another Rivals, it was like a Rivals 4, the final twist at the end of that season was whoever won into first place, whoever had the most points between the two players, we get to pick if they wanted to take all the money for themselves or split it with their partner. Now, as everybody knows, the end results came out that Ashley had more points 
was able to choose whether she wanted to keep all the 1 million for herself or split it with her partner Hunter, and she took all the money, making her, at that point, the richest challenger in challenge history via prize money. Question marks started popping up in the viewer's mind and even in the mind of their cast members who are in that cave. Because when taking a look at how close of a margin it was between first place and second place, between Joss and Sylvia and Ashley and Hunter, many viewers believe that Joss and Sylvia actually won the finals. However, because Joss and Sylvia were sort of friends on that season and neither person would take all the 1 million for themselves, many people believe that the challenge defaulted to hand Ashley and Hunter the win to where Ashley was able to take all the $1 million for herself. And honestly, it makes sense in the form of entertainment wise, because if you're the challenge and you put this twist out there that you could take $1 million, yet the twist does not get used, it's kind of like, I don't know, a little underwhelming in a way. I think what really plays a hand in this is how poorly the finals were run and edited. The final reckoning finals were so short, it basically took over one whole episode. There was a point system that was never really made clear on who was in front. There were things obviously edited out. There was portions of the finals that were edited out. It was kind of jumbled up together and wonky, the editing style for these finals, to the point where by the time we got to the end, to where the decisions and results, everybody was still questioning, how do we know who was in first place and who wasn't in first place? Hunter ate more plates but maybe Ashley ran faster than Hunter. Nobody knows. And everybody has these questions because it wasn't transparent. So it leads to more people questioning, is this true or is this not? And honestly, I was gonna put a pin in Final Reckoning, but I have to mention it. The format of Final Reckoning baffles me. And I feel like I'm the only person that's ever questioned Final Reckoning's format. Granted, the finals seems egregious, on how poorly it was run. But I feel like the whole season of Final Reckoning comes into question because the format was terrible. Like I mentioned, it was like a Rivals 4, but at this point, they didn't have enough for men-men teams and women-women teams as rivals or enough of men and women fighting uh, with each other to have the whole season as co-ed teams. Instead, they kind of just mishmashed all these rival pairings to where it was men-men teams going up against women-women teams going up against men-women teams? What now? And on top of that, they had this stupid redemption house that had the worst rules in challenge history. To me, I think the best redemption house was Dirty 30. You would have players move over to the redemption house. At a certain point, they would play a redemption game where one man and one woman, normally, would win back into the game, and that's just how you do it. And the rest of the people that lost would leave and they would be gone. However, for the Final Reckoning Redemption house, they would have this house overflowing with competitors. Then the competitors would go to a double cross pool where one team would secure themselves in the redemption game and they would get to choose anybody in the redemption house to play against in a redemption game where whoever wasn't picked would just get purged. I mean, there was points where people would just never get to compete on the rest of the season. They basically just got to stay in a house with the rest of these losers until like five episodes later, they could just finally walk away. I forget CT and Veronica was on that season because they were purged at a daily challenge to go to the redemption house. And then the next thing you know, they're just walking out because they weren't picked for the double cross game. But what's even dumber is that the two teams would face off against each other in a redemption style game. The one team that would win would get back into the house and the team that would lose would go back to the redemption house. What? How does that make sense? It leads to Polly and Natalie losing like three elimination slash redemption style games, yet somehow be able to make it into the finals. Granted, I'm sure that while coming up with the rules and the formats and the redemption house, that production didn't think that one team would continuously get to pull the double cross and would pick the same team to save and go up against in the redemption games over and over and over again. Yet it happened, and it's because they had faulty rules to let it happen. And then there were the heavy hitters and mercenaries for Final Reckoning. Not only would the players be surprised to go up against heavy hitters like Ashley and Hunter or Corey and Devin, the twist is that if the heavy hitters would win, they would get to come into the game and compete. How does this make sense? That a team could come in, win against a player in elimination halfway through the season or three fourths 
through the season would get to win themselves into the game and possibly win against players that have been in the game since day one. They're coming in fresher. They haven't had to, these pressures for eight to nine to 13 episodes like the rest of the house. And they get to come in and then saunter their way because they fit into a certain alliance or they have their friends within the game. Hunter and Ashley come in at like episode eight or nine and they just coast all the way. Now, granted they had their struggles as a duo, but they could have held on for half of the season comparatively if they would have started day one with each other. And the same thing with Corey and Devin, they came in episode 13. This is a 20 episode season. They came in in episode 13. They would have easily run away with the championship. Coming in episode 13 and leaving episode 15 because of a dumb, stupid decision to get yourself DQ'd. They had the game in the palm of their hand, especially winning against Zach and Amanda, who were the front runners to that season. I just hated almost everything about this format to this season. It made no sense. And that's why I think it's always gonna be towards the bottom. I know people have said like, oh, just watch it now that you can binge it because yes, the episode format didn't make sense and that the season is super long, but I can't get over how dumb the format to Final Reckoning is. I just can't get over it, I just can't. Now this video isn't just to critique and question things that have happened in more recent seasons like seasons 30 and up. And the final questionable decision I wanna talk about in this video is back in season six, Battle of the Sexes, where we have the David and Puck spitting situation. There was a lot of things on the show where the production team kinda of was just flying at the seat of their pants. And this is one of those moments where we see in episode one slash two, where David and Puck are having a disagreement in like day two. You're being a woman as you're a And that's when Puck spit in David's face. What? Uh, excuse me. Now the editing to the scene is weird as we don't even get to see what was happening or the conversation that happened before we hear David saying a whole bunch of personal attacks on him and then we see the spit. So I hate that we don't have full transparency on what happened prior to David coming at Puck and then Puck spitting. But we have Puck spitting on David right in front of us on camera. We get to see it. Yet what transpires and what results from this is baffling. Puck spits on David. David says he wants Puck out of this game. He just spit in my face. Disqualification. I've never been spat in the face before, ever. Yet every contestant wants Puck to stay in the game. We even see Jonathan Murray standing there saying like, oh, well, Puck is gonna be kicked off of the show. What's up? Bad news, you gotta go home. Really? Puck begs to stay on the show. He has majority of his cast members saying if Puck leaves the game, we're leaving the game, putting the production team in a very tight pickle. It's just weird. It's weird to see contestants standing up and having the back of another contestant who we all saw assault another contestant. Why do y'all have this sick back? Why do y'all still have this man's back? Now this is the point of the show where it is clear that there is a no hitting policy. And if you hit anybody or have any physical contact with anybody in a violent manner, you will be kicked off the show no questions asked. Spitting, the last time I saw, is listed as an assault. And you can be charged for spitting on somebody, yet that does not get into the brains of anybody on this cast, on this show. And now David is looked at as the person in the wrong. Why is people treating me like the spit came out of my mouth? Am I in the twilight zone? How? Does this make any sense? And then one of the final results that we get to is Puck says, if I can get David to spit in my face, then we should be all good, right? We should be all good and then everybody can go about their way because we spit in their face. David agrees that he was spit in Puck's face and then just said, no, I don't want to spit in your face. I want him off the show. But no, 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 that does not happen. Instead, after the first daily challenge, we have Puck strategizing and trying to get enough votes to vote David out of the game. So instead, 
David decides to pack up all of his bags because he feels like he is being ostracized by the rest of his competitors. He's being treated differently, even though he's the one that got spit in his face. He decides he's going to pack up his bags and he's going to take himself out of the game and disqualify himself from the game because he doesn't want to stay in the game with the rest of these competitors and then also be voted out after being spit in the face. So instead of me going down some bull I'm going to disqualify myself and I'm going home. This was so stupid. This was so disgusting and crazy. And then to see what the rest of the season would hold for Puck, where he would bring in his fiance and child. And then we had a whole episode devoted to Puck getting married. And then ultimately that led to Puck's wife having to leave. She got detained before getting back on the plane to go back home. And then Puck decided to trash the house, run around the house with a machete, cause massive damage around the house until they decided like, oh yeah, you can leave and go check out your wife and kids and make sure that they get on a plane and get home safely. This whole, this whole thing made my head hurt the first time I watched it and it still makes my head hurt. I can't believe the way this all went down in this season, absolutely asinine, so stupid. The question marks that get into my brain and then just make my head hurt. I can't believe it. But that is it for the first part of this questionable decisions by production video series. What do you think about this list? Let me know down in the comment section below which one still hurts your brain to think about, which one out of this list made you question the most and like I mentioned, if you like this video and you would like a part two, let me know down in the comment section below. And if you would like a part two, if you remembered something that you questioned, a moment, a cast member, something that production did, and you would like me to cover it in part two, let me know that as well down in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching. I wanna give a special shout out. Thank you to everyone who supports me over at patreon.com slash angelcakevids. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to everyone who is watching this video up to this point. I really, really appreciate it. I'll be back really, really soon with more challenge content, more content in general. But until then, peace.